Okay, um, good evening everybody. Um, let me welcome you to the public lecture for Oxford 2011. Um, I'm Louise Robson and I chair the Education and Outreach Committee at the Society. Um, so I thought it was quite fitting that um, I offered my services to give the introduction for the public lecture. Um, our speaker this evening is Professor uh, Russell Foster, who is a, a very well-respected research scientist. He's a fellow of the Royal Society. Um, his research, as we're going to hear this evening, is focused very much on the visual system and on our body clock as well. And, and as an eminent research scientist, he, for me, is one of the ideal people to be giving a public lecture because what we need to do as a society, as scientists, is actually get our science out into the community. And so a very special welcome, actually, to the members of the public um, who have attended the lecture. Um, we can tell that you're members of the public because you're not wearing uh, one of these little pink bands. So, so very, uh, very pleased that you've decided to join us. Uh, let me give you a little bit of information um, about the society. It was founded in 1876 um, by men, um, um, basically, uh, it's an excuse to get together, uh, have some nice food, um, and discuss physiological research. And um, this are just four photographs of some of the uh, members of the society from the early years. And I'd just like you to sort of keep those images in your, your brain. Uh, for many years, the society really existed to support physiologists in our research. Um, but what's become very apparent um, in the last few years is that uh, not just the physiological society, but all societies need to be much more outward-facing. We need to interact with the public. We need to interact with school children. And there are a number of benefits that, as a society, we can give to you, and there are benefits that the society can get back. I first started working uh, with schools around about 10 or 11 years ago. And, and when I used to ask the children, what were you expecting for the scientists, the physiologists that was coming in today, um, I'd often get something like this. Okay, so first they're all male. Uh, they're all wild and, and wacky and mad. Um, but, but, you know, 11 years ago, you would ask children what they thought about scientists, and this is what they would say. And you do a search on the internet, and almost exclusively, you would get mad images. It's changed a little bit, actually, uh, which is great. And the reason why it's changed is because societies such as the Physiological Society are actually going out now. Um, my Education and Outreach Committee uh, helps support a whole range of activities um, that are delivered by the Physiological Society members. This includes this public lecture, but also a whole range of activities in schools and its science festivals as well. And that, taken with some of the, the sort of national initiatives such as Science Week, has really changed the public's perception of science and scientists, and therefore physiologists and physiology. And I did this search this morning on Google, pulled up a very wide range of images. Clearly, we've got, still got the mad scientist issue, it's still coming out. Um, but now we're starting to get some images that are being pulled up um, that are scientists okay, maybe doing real science. I'm not sure whether these photographs have been engineered, but, but at least we're moving away from the mad scientists. And that's why it's important that as a society we have these kinds of events, the public lecture, um, because we can educate the public about physiology. We get to show the public that we are mostly a normal group of people, and I use the term mostly because we do have one or two individuals that could fit into the, the cartoon characters from the previous slide. But more importantly, we get to influence the next generation. Okay? The next generation of physiologists are going to come from the kids that are in schools now. And we need to get in there and we need to tell those children not just what physiology is, but how important physiology is for how we understand human health and human disease. And so, with no further ado, I'd like to invite Russell um, to come and take the stage to deliver his presentation this evening. Um, Russell. Thank you very much, Louise, and I'd just like to sort of emphasise, I think, the importance. I'm really de very delighted to be asked to give this presentation. It's one of the very few 
opportunities when sort of card-carrying scientists actually get the chance to interact with the people who pay our wages. And I think it's incredibly important that, that we can engage. So what I'd like to talk about this evening is sort of body clocks. And we're going to cover quite a bit of ground. Now, I, I think this will work better. So I want to sort of give an introduction on sort of circadian rhythms. Um, then move on to the light regulation of these body clocks, these circadian rhythms. And then talk about the timing of medication and, and some of the implications of having an internal clock. Then talk about the complexity of sleep-wake systems and how easy it is to disrupt them and some of the consequences of, of disruption. And then finish with a, a brief discussion uh, of the sleep systems and brain health. And what I really mean is, is mental health. Now, we're going to cover a lot of ground. Um, so if I say something that's stupid or incoherent or incomprehensible in any way, let's try and make this as informal as possible. I mean, it's kind of difficult in this environment. But, but, but if, I, if I do say something that needs clarification, wave. Um, and I will stop, clarify, and, and we'll, we'll go forward. Okay. So let's kick off with um, the circadian system. And a statement. 24 our body clocks or these circadian clocks and sleep processes have captured the popular imagination. And of course, you'll all be aware of things like this, and we'll touch on this. This is something I was actually rather proud of. This is an article I wrote for the Times Higher about the importance of taking the biological changes in teenagers into account. This tendency to go to bed late and get up late is not simply an artifact of being lazy. I mean, admittedly, there is an element of that, and, and I was partly inspired to write this as a result of the activity of my children, two of whom are in the audience here. Um, but actually, there's been some important consequences. This has been taken into consideration in sort of organization of timetables. There's, there's a school up in Monks Eaton who have actually sort of starting the day later. You'll see some of the data associated with that. Um, just recently, the Sunday Times magazine, how sleep deprivation almost drove me mad. Um, but I have to say that sometimes the coverage uh, by the press is not always entirely helpful. <clears throat> um, this is the Daily Mirror. Um, time to set your body clock. Uh, great that they were interested in this. And uh, I worked quite hard with Beth Gibbon on this. Natural rhythms rule our bodies and dictate the best times for a range of activities. And here's our countdown. Perfectly comfortable with that. Less comfortable with 10 a.m. Have a bikini wax. <laughs> or an injection. Or a visit to the dentist. Basically anything with an ouch factor. Pain intensity is at its lowest between 8 a.m., says Professor Russell Foster. <laughs> It's not entirely clear why, but it's probably because pain receptors aren't as alert as they are later in the day. Now, I promise you I never said that. Um, <laughs> and I certainly never said the following. 6.30 p.m. heralds the start of two and a half hours of sex and booze. So in about 25 minutes, if you're feeling a little frisky, um, then you know entirely what's going on. Okay. Und underneath all this extraordinary nonsense, there's some wonderful biology. And, and let's just look at this graph uh, for briefly. What we've got here are changes in, 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 in rhythmic physiology and behavior in humans and how they vary over the, the day. And we've got illustrations of this. So melatonin, this, this, this hormone that we'll hear a little bit uh, about later, comes out at night. And in anticipation of darkness, melatonin levels rise, they peak. And in, in anticipation of dawn, they decline. Body temperature, wonderful, about a degree variation in core body temperature. Low point around about 4 to 6 o'clock in the morning. In anticipation of activity, core body temperature rises and peaks at around about 6 to 8 o'clock in the evening. Actually, it has some real impact upon athletic performance. So if you happen to be a, an Olympic swimmer, uh, you can swim um, 100 meters, 2.7 seconds faster here than here. Now, clearly, if you exercise, you're going to increase core body temperature. But it's upon this internally gated moving baseline. So athletic performance is profoundly influenced. Um, and 2.7 seconds doesn't sound like a lot. But actually, of course, if you're an Olympiad, it's the difference between coming first and a really toe-curlingly embarrassing last. Um, so alertness and cognitive performance. This is really very important. Um, at sort of 4 to 6 o'clock in the morning, we're at our lowest um, uh, sort of cognitive performance. And that takes into account fatigue. 
In fact, some lovely studies have compared our drop in cognitive performance at this time of day with alcohol consumption. And in fact, your ability to perform is worse here at this time of the day than if you consumed sufficient alcohol to make you legally drunk. So perhaps if you take nothing from this lecture from the fact that if you're driving a car at four to six o'clock in the morning, your ability to drive that car is as bad as if you were legally drunk. Lapses in attention, no great surprise, they rise in, in, in concordance with this drop uh, in cognitive performance. Capacity to process fats. Um, it's relatively uh, good during the day. We can get rid of some of these fats if we take them in, but it's impaired at night which is perhaps part of the reason why there's high rates of cardiovascular problems in the night shift work. And that's something we can again discuss later. Now, it's not just these parameters that I've indicated here, but essentially everything. Cortisol, growth hormone, catecholamines, urine, sleep, the lot, is constantly being gated by this internal representation of a day. And what it's doing is fine-tuning physiology and behavior to the varying demands of the rest activity cycle. And these 24-hour rhythms, and they're called circadian rhythms because circa about a day, they persist under constant conditions. It's really worth emphasizing this. What that means is that if you or I went to a deep, dark cave, constant light, constant temperature, we'd still show about, not exactly, 24-hour oscillations in every aspect of our physiology and our behavior. So they're endogenous. And the origins of this internal day reside within an extraordinary structure called the SCN, or the suprachiasmatic nuclei. And what we, what we see here is a slice through the brain. So you can imagine the optic nerves coming in, fusing to form the optic chiasm here. And hopefully if we can get some cloud cover, you'll be able to see that. And here they are this sort of paired structure either side of the uh, third ventricle and just sitting above the optic chiasm. You can imagine a line from the bridge of your nose to your, your temple where those two intersect is where your, your master clock resides. Now, if you are a mouse or a hamster and this region of the brain is lesioned, then these 24-hour oscillations that we've been talking about are completely gone. And so to what extent can we extrapolate from mouse studies to our own species. You know, what happens if this bit of the brain actually goes wrong in you or I? And very recently, we've had the opportunity to study a very brave individual. Um, this shows the sleep-wake activity of a 50-year-old uh, individual. He's asleep here, very little activity, um, increasing activity during the day, dropping uh, during the sleep phase. This uh, uh, individual I'm going to be talking about had a tumor in the anterior part of his brain and it was progressing through into the hypothalamus and he was very much aware of what was going on and when this individual contacted us he was already having significant sleep-wake disruption much more fragmented and he asked if we could study this progression and we did and you see these very sobering slides we go from essentially a recognizable 24-hour pattern but as the tumor advanced through the brain until death, um, you see a complete loss of this entire uh, circadian 24-hour structure. As I say, an extremely brave individual, and we are very grateful that he took part in these studies. Actually, the, the, the definitive proof in humans that this is, this is the heart of the, of the day within. Okay, so we've got this SCN, 20,000 neurons in a mouse, about 50,000 in, in, in a human, so you'll see this number change from time to time. What's turned out to be truly extraordinary is that you can take one of these SCN neurons out, stick it in a dish, and record from it. And what you get are 24-hour oscillations. So an individual SCN neuron in isolation can generate its own clock. And that discovery in the 1990s um, told us that the clock is not the product of cell-cell interaction. It's not a network property. It actually resides within individual neurons and therefore must be a molecular, a molecular mechanism. And indeed, much of our understanding of this molecular clock arose from studies in the fruit fly, Drosophila. Seymour Benzer, in the early 1970s, working with a postdoc, Ron Konopka, mutagenized flies 
exposed them to chemicals that would disrupt their DNA, and then looked at the circadian behavior of these flies and found that in some of them it was very massively disrupted. And what they discovered is that these mutations were associated with a particular gene in the fruit fly, and they called it the per gene, the per period gene. And really, for a, for a very long period of time, it was assumed that Drosophila would have, and the invertebrates would have their own clock ticking away, and it would have no real influence. I mean, these would be a different mechanism in the vertebrates. But with the sequencing of the genomes in humans and mice, it then became possible to look for these sorts of genes in the genomes of the mouse and the human. And remarkably, very similar genes were found. They looked like the genes that you found in Drosophila, and when altered in a mouse, you could predictably, predictably alter the circadian, the 24-hour pattern of activity of these mice. And so really, by spanning backwards and forwards between the different genomes from invertebrates to humans, we've got a pretty good understanding of what this molecular clock is. And I find it quite extraordinary. You've got species separated by 400, 500, 550 million years of evolutionary divergence, and yet the way that these clocks are built is fundamentally conserved. And at the core of the, of the molecular feedback loop is, is a sort of a bit of a cartoon like this. You have a clock gene, and there's two bits to the gene, a bit that codes for the protein, and, and the promoter region here, where proteins will bind and activate the transcription and the production of the protein. And so what happens with these clock genes is that the promoters bind, they produce a message. The message, of course, is then turned into a protein. And this is the really cunning bit. The protein moves back into, or into the cell and turns off its own drivers. So essentially, you've got a molecular feedback loop. And you turn what is fundamentally a switch into a 24-hour oscillation on the basis of the rate you can produce the message, the rate you can translate it into a protein, the rate that the protein can uh, uh, be manufactured and uh, then gets back and interferes with these proteins on the promoter region. Now, <clears throat> it's a lot more than one gene. In fact, this is a, a hugely simplified model of the molecular feedback loop. And there are two critical gene families involved. There's the cry genes, of which there are two, and the per genes, of which there are three. And basically what's going on is that these proteins are being produced, they're, being, they're, they're, they're forming a complex, and this complex is then entering the nucleus and turning off their own transcription. In fact, we've now got a pretty good idea that probably 14 different key genes and their protein products are all taking part in this 24-hour molecular oscillation. Now, what's really exciting is that changes in clock genes are being linked to particular morning and evening types. So you know, the tendency, if you like, to get up early and go to bed early, you're a morning type. Now, can I see a show of hands? Who here would regard themselves as a, as a morning type? Okay. Um, evening types? Yes, I thought so. That's, that's, that's usually where it goes. Um, now... Uh, even if you are a morning type, you won't be like these poor, wretched individuals. The most extraordinary example we have so far of the relationship between these clock genes and sleep-wake timing is in familial advanced sleep phase syndrome. And it's actually been traced to four generations now. And these individuals, no matter what they've been doing, will fall asleep at around about 7.30 in the evening and will get up, wake up at around 3.30 to four o'clock in the morning. So their whole biological clock has been advanced, pulled earlier through time. And the discovery has been that it's a single change in one of the amino acids of the PER2 protein, which has affected its protein stability, which means that it's not decayed as rapidly, which means it gets into the nucleus faster and it turns off its genes quicker. And so you essentially speed it up the clock. And it's the best example we still have of a single amino acid change in a protein has a profound effect on complex behavior, such as the seat-wake cycle. So it's a wonderful bit of research. But it's not just the genes that determine whether we're morning or evening types. And this is some lovely work by Till Ronneberg. Um, he published this in now 2004. And this is his study looking at changes in sleep preference as one age. So you've got from the age of 10 
to the age of 80 along here, and you've got from being a sort of a morning type to an evening type along this axis. Now, this is for the, for the, for the males. And you'll see from the age of 10, there's an increasing tendency to want to go to bed later and later and later. Peaks at about 21, 21 and a half. And then there's a slow tendency to get up earlier and earlier and earlier in the mornings. Now, now I'm going to show the female result. Pretty similar, but, but they peak earlier, about 19, 19 and a half, and never get as late as the males. And then again, the same trajectory, slowly get up earlier and earlier and earlier. The good news is that when you're 55, you're, you're getting up at about the same time as your, as your partner. <coughs> Maybe good news, maybe bad news, I don't know. So the assumption here is that these changes in this morning and evening preference as a result of the steroidal changes, the hormonal changes that are going on uh, as one ages through puberty and then into uh, the loss of some of these hormones in, in, in the elderly. Okay, so what I've sort of implied is that you've got this master clock consisting of these 50,000 neurons in us um, each of which can generate a molecular oscillation, and that these then interact and simply drive rhythmic physiology. It's not like that. That's what we thought for years. And then a chap called Uli Schibler, a remarkable um, researcher from Switzerland, took out a group of cells, fibroblasts, that had been in culture for 30 years. And he did a very simple experiment. He, he, he looked at some of the genes that are known to be rhythmically expressed in the SCN, some of those clock genes. But what he did was dump in serum, just serum, calf serum, 50% calf serum. And what he did is shock the culture. And then he looked at gene expression, and what he found, much to his and everybody else's amazement, that these fibroblasts can essentially produce a 24-hour oscillation. And as the effect of shocking them passes over, then the, then the individual cells begin to drift apart and you see a breakdown in that beautiful, coherent 24-hour oscillation. And that paved the way for an understanding that essentially every cell in the body has its own molecular clock. And so our understanding of circadian organization changed enormously in the, in the 90s from this sort of forced um, idea that we had, the SCN driving rhythmicity, to rather more a sort of analogy of the SCN uh, acting a bit like the conductor of an orchestra. And we actually have a rather distinguished conductor, two distinguished conductors in the audience uh, this evening, whereby the SCN produces a rhythmic temporal beat from which all the cellular oscillators in the body take their reference cue and align their physiology accordingly. So, in the perfect situation, You've basically got all the organ systems under circadian regulation, and you see a beautiful alignment. But this can be disrupted. Classic example is jet lag. And what happens in jet lag is not a simple five-hour shift from, let's say, London time to New York time, but something rather more debilitating, which is that all of the cellular oscillators in the brain, the heart, the liver, and the stomach, and all the rest of it, take on their own oscillation and they all drift out of sync. So that's the reason why you feel so ghastly with jet lag. It's not because it's just five hours shifted. It's because internal physiology is a complete smear. It lacks beautiful, uh, coordinated alignment. Okay. That is a process called internal desynchronization, and we'll touch on that, that process a little bit later. Right. Any questions so far? Any, any, any issues that we need to explore? Is that all reasonably clear? Um, somebody's waving. Oh, yes? What in your fibroblasts? Yes, or oh, Uli Schibler's fibroblasts, yes. What, what, what actually he was measuring was, was clock gene expression. Um, and so basically a whole bunch of genes that had been associated to oscillating those SCN neurons, he measured those genes and their expression and found that they would oscillate perfectly well. And so it was a real, really shocking uh, um, um, discovery. We just didn't expect it. Each cell has, a, has an individual oscillator. Good. Thank you very much for clarifying that. If there are no more questions... Oh, okay. Yep. You'll have to shout. Sorry. 
Um, so when does the clock start in, in our development? Um, it's a shame that my colleague Katerina Wolf isn't, isn't here because she could answer that better than I could. She actually studied the development of the, of the, of the circadian rhythms after birth. And what she finds is that there's a lot of individual variability. Some babies are born with a pretty good 24-hour oscillation, and others, it can take two or three weeks to kick in. But, but frequently, at birth, you don't get a, a, a nice rhythmic 24-hour oscillation in, through things like sleep-wake, as many of us as, as, as parents discovered. Um, okay, let's now move on to the light regulation of the circadian system, and something that we've spent a lot of time studying. And so we have this situation in jet lag of this internal desynchrony. And of course, you get over jet lag by realigning your, your cellular oscillators. And the question is, how? And of course, it's exposure to the light-dark cycle as a result of a, a, a detector system within the eye. And let me emphasize that if you are unfortunate enough to have no eyes, then your ability to align in train Processes like sleep-wake to the light-dark cycle are gone. You don't abolish circadian rhythmicity, of course. What happens is that the clock then just drifts endlessly through time. If you have no eyes, that's what happens. It's unremitting jet lag for the rest of your life, with, with some exceptions. Okay, so in the 1990s, we asked what we thought was a, a terribly simple and naive question which is, how does the eye regulate the SCN? And what you see here is a, a cartoon of the eye and the critical layers in the retina. These are the, the rods and cones, the rods mediating dim light vision and these cones, color vision. And then the inner part of the retina consists of a series of, of layers which process that information before it's fired off into the brain through these ganglion cells which form the optic nerve which then project to the major visual structures within the brain. And what we did was a very simple experiment. We took mice in which, which had hereditary retinal disorders. In fact, mice that were being studied to try and understand ocular diseases in humans, such as retinitis pigmentosa. And these mice had lost most all of their rods and had some pretty grim, rudimentary cones left. And what was truly extraordinary is that the responses of the circadian system, the ability of these mice to regulate their body clock to the light-dark cycle seemed entirely unaffected, perfectly normal. And so these early studies said that a mouse can be visually blind, those animals lacked any classical visual responses, and yet their circadian system was perfectly intact. They were not circadian blind. And I was young and rather, rather impetuous, and so we then said, well, maybe there's something else in the eye, an uncharacterized photoreceptor, different from the rods and cones. This is in the early 90s. And the response of the, of the vision community at that time is, is sort of summarized in the next slide. Um, <laughs> it was vicious. I remember standing up at a meeting uh, in the States and, and, and showing some of the early data. And somebody sort of fair in a mid-row there where those, where those people are sitting, stood up, shouted bullshit and just walked out. I mean, it was really, really ferocious. Trouble is, um, they sort of had a point. They, there was a re the embedded in all of that nastiness was a semi-reasonable criticism. Because remember, there were those pretty crude, pretty ghastly cones left. And the argument was the circadian system could probably maintain normal sensitivity with just a few rods and cones left. It's different from vision, so, so, you know, why propose a new receptor system? So, clearly what we were then prompted to do was do better experiments. And in this case, what we did was breed our rodless animal with an animal that lacked any cone receptors. And so what you can do is eliminate the whole of the rods and the cones. And this is the assay that we then used. We looked at a wheel running. You can basically put these mice into a wheel and you can connect that to a computer. And first of all, we would look and see if they could align their activity to the dark portion of the light-dark cycle, the nocturnal animals. And then you've got a really cunning way of going forward. If you plunge the animals into complete darkness, the clock drifts through time. The mouse clock is slightly shorter than 24 hours, so it starts a little bit earlier and earlier each day. And you can then turn the lights on here. And you see that the next day, 
you see a shift in its activity, and you can measure that shift beautifully. So it's an absolutely beautiful, exquisite behavioral assay. And these are the data. Here's increasing the brightness of this light exposure here, and here's the size of the shift, this displacement um, uh, in, the, in the activity. And the RDCL, the rodless coneless animal was here, and here's the wild type. So clearly, you didn't need your rods and cones to be perfectly able to regulate your circadian system. In fact, it was doing it in a manner that was utterly indistinguishable from the wild-type animal. And so these early data allowed us to say that, that there must be a third ocular photoreceptor within the eye, and it's provided the conceptual framework to address what this receptor is and what it's doing. And, and I just want to give you some flavor of that line of research that has, that's followed. Any questions before we go on? All comfortable about that data? Yes, over there. Is it conceivable that there are uh, biosensors in other cells, like Yeah, I, I mean, the, the, the issue was always that, that if you covered the eyes and used opaque, for example, contact lenses, uh, you would block any effects of light on the circadian system. So it's very, very good that you raised that because it had to be an ocular photoreceptor. Clearly, you know, we do respond to light in terms of vitamin D. So it could have been that mechanism. But the critical data were these opaque contact lenses that were used. Okay, so working with very close colleagues, um, Rob Lucas and Mark Hankins, and work undertaken by Sum Sakharan, what you can do is take the rodless conus retina and then load it up with a, a dye um, which changes its fluorescence when the cells become active. And what we're going to see here is this layer of the retina. These are the ganglion cells. And these gray-black blobs are the ganglion cells. Now, I think I'm... <laughs> Teach me not to do that again. Um, so what we're seeing here... is background levels of calcium. It looks like a scene from Star Wars. Um, the lights are going to go on any second here. And look at the latency. Several seconds go by. And then in the rodless coneless retina, the ganglion cells are responding directly to light. And it was a great technique because you can not only look at individual, uh, multiple cells at the same time, but this shows the individual light response of a single ganglion cell. So it's not the rods and cones. What is it? It's a small number of directly light-sensitive ganglion cells in the retina that are, that are, that are responding to light. It's a, been a great and a long story, and it's something that we're continuing with. But we now know that it's based upon an interesting molecule called melanopsin, nothing to do with melatonin, utterly different, uh, melanopsin. And interestingly enough, melanopsin has its peak sensitivity in the blue part of the spectrum. So if you were God, as it were, and you wanted to design a detector that would be adapted to the peak spectral sensitivity in the sky, it would be to about 480 nanometers, which is absolutely the blue-blue part of the sky. So you've got a novel light-sensitive molecule peaking in the blue part of the spectrum. Okay, so a whole string of studies that have been undertaken in mice have shown these light-sensitive ganglion cells. But what's also been exciting is that what we're finding in mice seems to be entirely true of our own species. And in fact, studies in humans have in turn informed studies in mice and our, our broad mechanistic understanding of this completely new light-sensitive system. And what's, what's emerged as a result of studies both in humans and in mice is that this receptor, which we originally conceived of as a circadian light sensor, has turned out to be a lot more exciting. It's regulating sleep. It's regulating alertness. It can even have an effect upon stress levels via hormonal release. And indeed, part of our pupil constriction is even being modulated by these receptors. In fact, what these receptors allow the pupil to do is maintain pupil constriction under sustained bright light conditions. So next time you're out on a sunny day and you look at somebody's pupil and you know it's, it's, you see it all constricted, it's those photosensitive ganglion cells that are imparting that information to those bits of the thalamus um, that are regulating pupil constriction. So 
what we've discovered is that it's not simply a circadian photoreceptor, but it's a, it's a broad brightness detector system um, providing modulation for many different physiological systems. And this is having big, implication, oops, big implications in, both in eye hospitals. So, for example, the discovery of a third receptor system within the eye tells us that the clinical diagnosis of complete blindness should assess the state of both the visual and the light sensitive ganglion cell systems. And this is now creeping in to everyday ophthalmology. Eye loss plunges individuals into a world that lacks both vision, clearly, but also a proper sense of time. That appalling imposition of essentially unremitting jet lag for the rest of your life if you have no eyes, in addition to loss of vision. And at the moment, there are no good clinical guidelines to give patients advice in that area, and that's what we're working on in Oxford. Also, I said the clinical guidelines must incorporate information related to both the visual system and the sensitive ganglion cell system. So also, if you've lost your vision, but those light-sensitive ganglion cells are still there, then you should be encouraged to seek out sufficient light every day to maintain circadian entrainment. You shouldn't... There are good reasons why you may need to wear dark glasses, but, but often it's aesthetic. You should actually seek out that light and use it to regulate the clock. Another really interesting area is in the way we light our homes. And, and, I, and I'm sorry, this, this next image is profoundly depression, de depressing, and people ask me not to show it, um, but I think you're brave enough. Um, this is the environmental light in a nursing home at 20 past 2 in the afternoon. And anybody who's been into a nursing home will appreciate it's, it's pretty dim. Um, this happens to be 20 lux, and I'll explain the importance of that in a moment. And indeed, this is a lovely study which has actually looked at the average light exposure of individuals in a nursing home, 55, 54 lux throughout the day, with only about 10 minutes spent over 1,000 lux. Well, why is that important? Let's just look at environmental light levels. So on a bright sunny day, even in the UK, you can get 100,000 lux. Bright, beautiful light. Cloudy day, outside now, it's probably in the region of 20, maybe 25,000 lux. Watch repairman's bench, 1,000 to 2,000 lux. Typical office setting is around about 300 lux. Sitting room, 50 to 200. So, so it's dim, it's dim light compared to natural light. And, of course, residential street lighting and then a, a cloudy moonlight day, a, a cloudy moonlight. Well, the sorts of levels of light that you need to, to robustly regulate your circadian system are here. So most of us are living in dim, dark caves, um, and we're able to cope with that because we have some time outside. We have exposure to bright light outside at some portion of the day, and that is frequently sufficient to lock the clock on. However, if you're stuck in a nursing home and exposed to these sorts of light levels, there's not a robust way of regulating the clock. And this is a theme that's been taken up by Aus Lansomeron in a lovely study he published in 2008. And these were mildly demented individuals in a nursing home environment. This shows the sleep-wake uh, uh, structure of individuals uh, before he went in and added bright lights in the living areas and darkness in the in the sleeping areas. And he converted this ragged sleep rate profile into a really quite respectable uh, behavior. And more important than that, perhaps, he actually improved cognition in this mildly uh, group of demented individuals by 10%. And it raises sort of the important issue. To what extent is our declines in cognition in the elderly uh, in nursing home environments the result of the brain not performing properly or as a result of the sleep-wake timing disruption. And that's now an area that also is being explored um, both in Oxford and in other places around the world. Okay, any, any further questions before we move on to medication? All happy? Uh, yes? Um, that's actually a surprisingly complicated situation. I can tell that you're not from these parts. Um, maybe it's Australia. Yes. Well, you can always tell the Brits getting off the plane when they arrive in Australia because they're looking up and thinking, Christ, that's what the sun looks like. <laughs> um, now, the difficulty is 
The effects of light on the clock are not standard over the day. At dusk, you tend to delay the clock, so you get up later the next day. And at dawn, you tend to advance the clock. You, 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 you get up a bit earlier. Now, if you're flying from London to Australia, usually it's a night flight. And you have to be a bit careful, because you'll actually hit light in London time, which would delay the clock. And actually, what you want to do is, of course, pull it forward in time. So what you have to do is, in that direction, going to Australia, wear dark glasses until the middle of the afternoon, then go out and seek out the sun. It's all in my book. Um, <laughs> and, uh... <laughs> OK, thank you for that wonderful free advertising. Um, <laughs> timing of medication. Well, in view of all this dynamic physiology, perhaps it's no great surprise that there are real time of day uh, health implications. And of course, disease symptoms vary over the 24 hour day. So here we have uh, a day represented. Between 6 o'clock in the evening and midnight, there's likely to be um, sort of a, a crisis in, in ulcers. Stomach acid production is peaking uh, over this time. And interestingly, the pain of osteoarthritis tends to be an evening pain. By midnight to 6 a.m. in the morning, you have, in the early part of the night, strokes due to hemorrhaging. Blood vessels burst in the brain and you have a stroke. Asthma attacks were also traditionally in the middle of the night. This is the dangerous phase, 6 a.m. to 12 noon. There's a rapid rise in blood pressure in anticipation, of course, of increased activity, but superimposed upon that, of course, is activity, which drives up blood pressure even further. And so stroke due to clot formation, low blood pressure overnight, clots are formed, increasing blood pressure flies into the circulation, and as we'll see in a moment, greatly increased chance of having a stroke in this 6 a.m. to 12 noon uh, new window. Not surprising, angina attacks in this window. And interesting enough, joint pain, rheumatoid, arthr rheumatoid arthritis tends to be a morning pain as distinct from evening pain of osteo. And your GP actually may ask you when you have joint pain, and that, that's used as an initial diagnosis of whether it's osteo or rheumatoid arthritis. So, 12 noon, actually, not a lot. So, tomorrow, when you look at your wristwatch and you see it's 12 noon, um, you can sort of think, oh, thank goodness for that. I've just survived the most dangerous part of the day before you slide into the terrors of the, of the next few hours. Let's look at this, this, this um, uh, stroke in a bit more detail. These are data by Peter Rothwell, a colleague of mine here in Oxford. And this is the time of day and the frequency of a stroke. And you see between 6 a.m. and 12 noon, a 49% greater chance of having a stroke than any other time of the day. It's really very, very marked. And it's not, it's in many conditions have this, 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 this sort of circadian and physiologically gated uh, peak. So what you might expect then, if we know about these sorts of things, is that we should be giving the right drug at the right amount at the right time for each individual. Most of the time, we sort of give the right drugs, I think. Right amount, broadly. I mean, it certainly doesn't kill you, usually. Um, right time, of course, it's very rarely taken into consideration at all. Most drugs and treatments are not given on the basis of body time, but on the basis of convenience and compliance alone. It doesn't really take into account our internal biology. Now, when you talk to the pharmaceutical industry, they say, yeah, of course, we know all about clocks and we, we deal with that. Because what we do is we develop drugs that survive for long periods in the body and so essentially more or less coincide with those peaks in pathology. So we've got that sort of sussed. Yes and no. This strategy, of course, greatly increases the potential side effects that these medications will have. You're giving a drug at a higher concentration and, and, and for a longer duration than you actually need. And of course, as we've just said, side effects give rise to more drugs, more drugs, more side effects. And so we're sort of locked into a rather dangerous set of feedback loops here, where, where, where I suppose the point I'm trying to make is that we need intelligent and informed delivery of medicine that coincides with our biology. And talking of which, what about drug testing using mice and rats? Our drugs, quite rightly, are, are, are screened using rodent models. But are we doing it properly? Well, if you think about it, we are a diurnal animal. We're awake during the day and we're asleep at night. And this is, of course, when we take our, our drug interventions, usually. However, 
if you think about it, we're waking mice up in the middle of their sleep phase, giving them a, a test of some sort, and then extrapolating 12 hours back to our biology. And the question is, is that appropriate? Does 12 hours actually matter? And in some cases, it most certainly does. This is an old study looking at the effect of giving a bacterial toxin to different populations of mice over the light-dark cycle, and you see you get 80% mortality at the end of the sleep phase, whereas it drops to 20% towards the end of the activity phase. Huge variation in the impact of this pharmaceutical, well, in this case it was, it was a toxin on the biology of this animal. And I don't think it's that dangerous drugs have come to market because they've been inappropriately tested in this way. My fear is that there are drugs sitting on the shelves in Zurich and London and other places around the world which, which were originally screened, had really bad side effects and thought, well, no, this is clearly not something that we can use. Maybe 12 hours later or 8 hours later, the, um, uh, the toxicity would have been mitigated and then we could have used the drug. So, at the moment... Very few companies take this into account. So do we have good, tangible evidence where time of day delivery of drugs has an effect on our biology and our survival? And I'm deliberately showing you an old study. 1993, it was with children with, child, uh, with, 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 with leukemia, and they were given this cocktail of drugs either in the morning or the evening. And those children that had the drug in the morning versus the evening had a two-and-a-half-fold greater chance of relapse. So same drug, same concentration, different time of day, profoundly different effects. Okay. Let's now look at, um, goodness, sleep and, and sleep-wake disruption. The generation of sleep involves much more than just this master pacemaker, this, this conductor of the circadian orchestra that we were talking about earlier. The sleep-wake cycle, of course, is very much modulated by the circadian pacemaker, telling it, now is the appropriate time to be awake, now is the appropriate time to be asleep, and there's feedback from this biology in here, probably on the pacemaker itself. But there's another really very important driver, and that's sort of, I suppose, the intuitive part about sleep, which is the, the homeostat, the hourglass. The longer you've been awake, the greater the sleep pressure, the greater the need for sleep. And so you have a very important cycle here. And adenosine, the buildup of adenosine in the brain may be very important as part of that process. In our society, the alarm clock, it drives the sleep-wake cycle in very many individuals. So, show of hands, how many people here were woken up by the alarm clock this morning? You're not getting enough sleep. It's simple as that. If you're waking up um, with an alarm clock, you're simply not getting enough sleep. <clears throat> and that, and was that, Charlotte, you're not getting us sleep. It's my daughter. <laughs> okay. We've talked about the impact of the light-dark cycle, setting the clock, which in turn sets aspects of the sleep-wake cycle. More complicated, because there's another loop. The light-dark cycle, via the master pacemaker, is regulating the pineal. The pineal is producing melatonin. Many of you have taken melatonin as a... Uh, an anti-jet lag tablet. How does it work? Not absolutely clear. But it's probably doing two things. It's probably finding, providing a biological representation of the dark and feeding back on the pacemaker. There are lots of receptors in the SCN that bind to melatonin. And it probably has a direct acute sleep-inducing effect on the mechanisms that I'm going to unpack from here in a moment. And, of course, the light-dark cycle has a direct effect on many of the arousal systems within the brain. So it's complicated. And, in fact, if you look at the brain structures that give rise to sleep-wake, they're all over the place. There's structures in the forebrain. There's four major structures in the hypothalamus, two key structures in the midbrain. And throughout the whole of the hindbrain, all of these structures producing all of these structures with all of these different neurotransmitter systems. And the point for me to sh showing all this is that this complexity makes sleep disruption really easy. There are lots of points at which you can screw up the system. And it explains why sleep problems are so common. And, of course, sleep disruption has been best studied and in most detail in shift workers. So let's have a quick look at the impact of sleep disruption. 
Most night shift workers do not shift their physiology in the response to the demands of working at night. Extraordinary, you can be on the sh a night shift for 20 years and your body clock will not adapt. Why? Any thoughts? I'm going to pick on somebody in the audience, I tell you. <laughs> exactly. You're exposed to the same light dark cycle as everybody else, and so you're locked on to, to, to that pattern. Um, and so if you think about it, the night shift worker is active when physiology is sort of in the resting state. And so, of course, you can override this effect, but you can't possibly expect peak performance. The other huge problem is that when you're trying to sleep during the day, you've got that huge sleep pressure, you've been up all night, but it's not aligned to the body clock. The body clock is saying, hang on, it's daytime, you should be awake. And this misalignment of the body clock and the homeostat is, is why most night shift workers, or many night shift workers, uh, get less than five and, a half, five, five and a half hours of sleep every, every night. And this sleep deprivation and disruption has been linked to this appalling set of consequences. Drowsiness, abrupt mood shifts, increase in irritability, anxiety and depression. Let's look at metabolic problems. This is some work that's come out of University of Chicago, of Van Counter. And what she did was take healthy young males, allow one group to sleep for four hours, only four hours, and another group up to ten if, if, she, if they wanted to, and then looked at the hormone ghrelin at the end of that seven days. It was up by 28%. Carbohydrate consumption in that group was up by 35 to 40 percent, predisposing, of course, to weight gain. Conversely, she found that leptin, the satiation hormone, was down by 17 um, percent, and, and, and so, of course, this seesaw here, um, of course, predisposes towards weight loss. Now, um, you have to guess which one of, of these two images is me. Um, <coughs> The point being is that we're getting some physiological understanding of, of the impact of sleep loss in uh, metabolic systems and some understanding of data like these. This is hours of sleep each night and the percent likelihood of being obese. Less than four hours, 73% likelihood, five hours, 50, six hours, 23. Now, it's not the whole explanation, clearly. If you're awake for 20 hours, you're probably going to be eating more. But the point is that if you are sleep disrupted, you're predisposed to sleep, uh, to, to weight gain. Decrease cognitive performance, ability to concentrate, reduce communication and decision skills. This is a brain, a brain image um, of, a, of a healthy, rested brain performing mathematical tasks. You see all these wonderful areas lighting up. This is the same individual after sleep disruption. That's the bit of the brain. Extraordinary change in the brain's ability to, to respond to the demands of, 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 of mathematical tasks. It's a beautiful illustration of how the tired brain is just not really up to it. And the problem is that tired brains indulge in stimulant and sedative use. So tired brains, the second thing the tired brain will crave in the morning is some caffeine, if you're really wicked, some nicotine. And caffeine and nicotine fuel the wake state for many individuals throughout the day in the Western world. Trouble is, they can have quite a long half-life in the body. And so it gets to 11 or 12 o'clock, the individual is awake, wanting to go to sleep, and then sedates themselves using alcohol or drugs. Now, these sedatives do not provide a biological mimic for sleep. So you then surface from a drug-induced sleep requiring more stimulants, more sedatives, and, and a really rather nasty feedback loop. And researchers like Mary Kaskaden have pointed out that this is particularly uh, dangerous in, young, in children and young adults who are on average sleeping between one and two hours uh, every night less than they were in the 1950s. Tired brains craving stimulants during the day and alcohol and sedatives at night. Okay, let's now move to the last um, few slides, which is sleep systems and brain, and brain health. And really what I mean here is mental health. What's really absolutely fascinating is that brain disorders are almost always associated with some form of sleep and circadian rhythm disruption. And they share many of the features of sleep-wake disruption. So, for example, you see in many mental health conditions and in neurodegenerative diseases 
considerable components of this. Mood shifts, anxiety, metabolic problems, cognitive performance, stimulant, sedative use, and, and, and reduced ability to multitask. All of that are frequently found in, in, in uh, uh, mental health and neurodegenerative disease. And what's also interesting is that the best indicator of an impending depressive episode is actually a change in the sleep-wake before the depression actually kicks in. So we've known about this sort of stuff for a very long time. But it's been frequently dismissed in the case, for example, of schizophrenia as, well, these individuals don't hold, hold down a job, so no wonder they go to, bed, let, go, go to bed late, get up late, you know, don't have friends, miss my clinic. Um, or it's been sort of uh, ascribed to an artifact of the antipsychotics they're on. And in fact, it was a conversation like that in a lift with a, with a psychiatrist in another institution than this one, I, I, I stress, um, that we started to look at patients with schizophrenia. And, and this is work led in my group by um, Katerina Wolf. This shows an employed individual. And what we've done here is, is here's midnight and here's 8 o'clock in the morning. And the data are plotted twice, so day one, day one, day two, day two. So basically you can see the patterns. And you see here a perfectly aligned sleep-wake profile, and these are the peaks in melatonin around about four uh, in the morning. Here's an unemployed individual, basically the same. Interestingly enough, they're not terribly delayed. Evidence in this individual here of going to bed late and getting up a bit later, but actually statistically, unemployed individuals are getting up and going to bed like unemployed individuals. Here's a patient with schizophrenia, and you see this extraordinary drifting pattern of activity, which is, which is then bleeding into the night phase. They're up most of the night, asleep during most of the day, and then the clock simply fell apart, and it was utterly fragmented. This is an individual we've followed since 2001, and she's delayed, she's getting up late and going to bed late, and then there are bouts when she just gets up later and later and later, day after day after day. And in fact, um, also with her hormonal rhythms, and the whole of 2004 was spent like that, drifting endlessly through time. She's got a perfectly normal visual system. Profound sleep-wake disruption in these individuals. Just the last few slides in bipolar. Bipolar is not as bad as schizophrenia, but these are individuals, and this is work done with Guy Goodwin here in psychiatry, um, at, at individuals at high risk of developing bipolar. Do they have a sleep phenotype? This is the control, normal individuals, rest activity profile, very little activity at night. When you first looked at those individuals at high risk of developing bipolar, it looked perfectly normal. But actually, if you look in more detail, they're asleep but they're moving around. They're very active at night, despite being asleep. So there's a very distinctive phenotype that's emerging in those individuals at risk of developing bipolar. So what's the connection between circadian sleep abnormalities and mental health? What are we talking about here? And this is sort of the model that we're working on, and I'm almost done. An abnormal pattern of neurotransmitter release within the brain will predispose you to um, a brain abnormality, maybe a psychiatric illness or some sort of neurodegenerative disease. But, of course, an abnormal pattern of neurotransmitter release is almost certainly going to impinge upon the sleep and circadian systems. Remember all those things I showed you earlier. Um, all of those neurotransmitters and brain structures that are involved in regular sleep stability. And so anything that's changed here that predisposes you to that is almost certainly going to have an impact upon this. And then the problem, of course, is that you precipitate a whole raft of further problems. Chances are you're going to activate the stress axis, and a whole bunch of that is going to lead to all of those um, issues that we talked about earlier. These are going to feed back on this, further disrupt it, further disrupt that, and further predispose you to um, an abnormal brain state. And the point I'm trying to make here is that mental health problems are almost always associated with some form of sleep and circadian rhythm disruption. Understanding this relationship will provide a much better understanding of brain mechanisms that are common to sleep, sleep wake timing, and neurological disease. We actually have ways of using mental health, for example, to understand more fundamentally the mechanisms that underpin timing and sleep. And then, of course, excitingly, we can use the sleep circadian disruption as a marker of, for the diagnosis of brain disorders. If we know that a particular individual is vulnerable of developing bipolar, we can perhaps use that as an early warning to think about intervention. 
And then, of course, finally, we can develop treatments that regulate sleep and sleep timing for the reduction of symptoms and perhaps improve quality of life for both the individuals and their carers. Okay. We finished. We've covered an awful lot of ground. Um, what we discussed, first of all, was this extraordinary endogenous representation of a day, which is fine-tuning so many aspects of our physiology and behavior. We really are very different creatures at midnight and midday. And part of the way in which we align internal time to the external world is via the, by these new receptors. We, we find that the eye is doing two fundamentally different things. It's grabbing light to produce an image of the world, and of course we've known that forever. Um, but, but there's another light sensor in there, which is, which is an irradiance detector regulating the clock and a whole raft of other areas of physiology. Knowing about this has helped sort of explain that medical intervention and medical therapeutics must take time of day in, 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 into account. And by ignoring this, we're missing very many useful opportunities in therapies. We've looked at sleep and sleep-wake disruption, and that it's extraordinary. Sleep in a 24-7 society is the first victim. We marginalize sleep. You don't need sleep. You can get along without it perfectly well. Well, you can't. You need sleep, and if you disrupt sleep, it's going to precipitate a whole raft of health problems. And finally, we looked at this sort of emerging area where there seems to be a genuine mechanistic overlap between the drivers that regulate sleep-wake and also the same systems that seem to predispose you for mental health problems and neurodegenerative diseases. And understanding this relationship, again, has huge, I think, therapeutic uh, potential. And with that, thank you for your attention.